It is the worst single loss of life in Lexington history and one of the worst tragedies ever in Kentucky. Tonight is the eve of the one year anniversary of the crash of Comair Flight 5191. This time last year, some were still packing, others already asleep for an early morning flight, and one couple still celebrating at their wedding reception. 49 people settling in for what would be their final night. Tonight, we look back at the crash, the crew, the passengers, and the aftermath of Flight 5191. Sunday morning, August 27, 2006, five minutes after six. Comair Flight 5191 is cleared for takeoff on runway 22. Its destination, Atlanta, Georgia. A flight scheduled to take an hour and 25 minutes is just minutes away from becoming Kentucky's worst air disaster. Captain Jeff Clay, a veteran pilot and Kentucky native familiar with Bluegrass Airport, steers the plane into position for takeoff and hands the controls over to his first officer, James Polhinky, who would become the lone survivor of the crash. Also on board, Flight Attendant Kelly Heyer, a two-year veteran of Com Air. 47 passengers boarded the doomed flight, all with different destinations. The newlyweds heading on their honeymoon, the couple flying to their beach wedding, another on vacation to celebrate their 31st wedding anniversary. There was the volunteer who was helping rebuild homes and hope on the Gulf Coast, and the pilot for another airline just hitching a ride to work in Atlanta. 47 people, 47 stories. 47 journeys unfinished. Cleared for takeoff on runway 22, the pilots, for reasons we may never know, take off from the much shorter runway 26. The pilots struggle to pull the plane into the air, but simply run out of room, clipping trees and crashing into a fireball on a farm next to the airport. <laughs> Badly injured but alive, first responders pull the first officer to safety. No one else can be saved. Thirteen thousand man hours went into the investigation. The final cause released just a month ago. Pilot error named the ultimate cause of the tragedy, but investigators list several other contributing factors. There would be no moment where we could point to one thing and say, aha, that is what caused this accident. One year ago, they were strangers. Now they share a tragic bond. Just a few hours ago, many of the victim's family members came together for a public memorial at Southland Christian Church. Mark Kennedy has more on the emotional ceremony. As it was one year ago, right after the crash, members of the community lined the streets in front of the church with messages for the families that lost loved ones. Just to let them know that people, people actually care what happened, not just forget about them. Inside Southland Christian Church, nearly 1,300 people came to remember those from Flight 5191. We come together as family and friends and community to honor those who lost their lives on that tragic day. We may never gather in quite this same way again, so let us pause to consider, albeit briefly, the future. To the families, please know that this community has shared your loss in the past and we will continue to share your loss in the future. For those of you who live elsewhere, we look forward to your returning often. May those visits always be comforting. For those of you who live here in central Kentucky, please know that your friends and neighbors will continue to love and support you as you journey on. Please let us know what we can do because too often we just simply cannot understand how we can best help. 
Along with Lexington Mayor Jim Newberry, the first responders. Kentucky Governor Ernie Fletcher added his comments to the grieving families. It is our hope as a community that you too will reach a place of peace and that in some way this memorial service will help you along that path. I believe those we remember today would want that of us. Thank you and God bless. Next, John Weiss, pastor of Southland Christian Church, added this silent but very powerful message. Wayne Turner is a family member of one of those 49 people that died. He spoke on behalf of the families. I'm thinking of a, a waitress in a local restaurant. I had left one of the early NTSB briefings, and I didn't realize that I must have still had the badge around my neck that identified me as a family member. And I walked in, and she saw me and took my hand. And just made sure I was okay. That's the kind of community you have. Turner also paid special tribute to the first responders. <laughs> to close out the program, the 49 victims' names were read. Joanne Wright. Betty Young. Today's memorial and tomorrow's private ceremonies will cap a year of grieving and healing for the families and the community. Some of the events which led to the crash were set in place before the pilots even boarded that plane. There are two runways at Bluegrass Airport off for sales road just west of downtown Lexington. The main commercial strip, which is about 7,000 feet long, and the much shorter general aviation runway, which is 3,500 feet and unlit. The runway the pilots of Flight 5191 tried to take off from. A repaving project just one week before the crash changed the taxi routes to the runways. The pilots did not have updated maps of the airport. It was a moment no one who lives in the area will ever forget where you were when you heard about the crash. For many of us, it was an early Sunday morning wake-up call. We scrambled for information and for answers that morning. Chief Meteorologist T.G. Shuck and aviation enthusiast played a major role in our coverage. And tonight, he looks back at those first few hours after Flight 5191 went down. Comair Flight 5191 never made it far off the ground that warm Sunday morning last August. As the Canadair regional jet carrying 50 passengers and crew to Atlanta came crashing back to Earth, Lexington and Central Kentucky changed forever. Yes, but as we hit the 10 o'clock hour, let's uh, let our viewers, some, some are just joining us now. Well, the tragic news this morning that just after 6 o'clock, uh, a Com Air flight 5191 was leaving from Bluegrass Airport towards Atlanta and apparently just uh, moments after taking off, crashed. We did take one individual off the airplane. He's at the University of Kentucky Medical Center. Uh, I believe he's in surgery now. Uh, but the remaining 49 passengers uh, or crew are fatalities. Before anyone's moved, I put together uh, chaplains from um, the fire department, the uh, police department, from the sheriff's department. And as I go back, we're planning on having a, a mass prayer at the, uh, at the site back there before we move anyone. Never before in the 60-year history of Bluegrass Airport had a major commercial aircraft crashed in the area. This couldn't happen here. This was Lexington, Kentucky. Our city, our community, our home. Tragedies like this we only read about in newspapers or saw stories on television from some faraway place. But now Lexington was the story, and those early hours following the accident, shock was the one true emotion gripping everyone. Over the hillside, I saw the uh, flash of light and then the explosion and then just a big plume of smoke come up. My, my buddy that I brought over just a minute ago, it's his nephew, and uh, he was on his way back to Naples. So he's flying to Atlanta, and uh, he's supposed to call his wife from there around 7.30, and uh, she did not get a phone call. Uh, of course, we're trying to put everything together, and you can't. You really can't find anything out. So the next best thing was just come over here. They shuttled us from the airport.
and brought us over here to a room and a gentleman from Com Air stood up and announced that there were no survivors and that was it. Here at WKYT, most of us had never covered a major plane crash before. So those first few moments were spent gathering as much information as possible and simply trying to get a handle on one of the biggest stories many of us may ever cover. One of the basic rules of journalism is don't get emotionally involved in your story. But this was different. Many people had lost their lives that morning, people that may have been our neighbors, our friends, our viewers. As the names of those who perished trickled in, it was clear to see the effect of the crash on the entire Commonwealth would be far-reaching. Rob Romley is here now with uh, some additional information uh, about the uh, former UK baseball player uh, and his wife who were aboard that plane this morning. That's oh, right. That's right. Yes, they were married just last night. Uh, the player, uh, John Hooker, who came out of North Laurel High School and went to play for Keith Madison. He pitched for the Wildcats from 1998 through 2001. This is Larry Turner here, and Larry is the Associate Dean for Extension and Director of the Cooperative Extension Service at the University of Kentucky. Sam, among the many heartbreaking stories from this horrible crash was that of Patrick Smith, a member of the Habitat for Humanity International Board of Directors. While families began to deal with their tragic loss, and the first responders continued the grim task of recovery, on the anchor desk, we started to ask the question, why did this happen? The immediate focus was on the runway. Comair Flight 5191 appeared to have used that morning and how some of the construction and changes to the taxiways and runways at the airport the previous week may have caused some confusion. This particular taxiway is now closed because that takes pilots out to the buffer zone. What they need to do is, at the head of runway 26 right here, they need to curl right across this taxiway right here and hit runway 22. So where those intersect and you've moved the runway down a little bit and this process only occurring within the last week or so, when you got to this point, potentially here, you go straight to hit 22 or you make a left to hit 26. Nearly a year after the crash, the National Transportation Safety Board cited pilot error as the major cause of the accident. But on the morning of August 27, 2006, none of that really mattered to most folks. What did matter was that 49 souls were lost and a community was changed for a lifetime. The final cause of the crash of Comair Flight 5191 was released just about a month ago at a meeting of the National Transportation Safety Board in Washington, D.C. While much speculation had already surfaced as to the outcome of the investigation, no one really knew what the final papers would read and who would take the blame. In the end, much of that blame was placed on Captain Jeff Clay and his co-pilot James Polhinky. Amy Clay, Jeff's widow, sat down with our Deanne Stevens to talk about life one year later and more on the NTSB's findings. It's an exhausting and grueling and um, um, certainly life-altering. I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that. I'm sure a lot of people say that, um, but that's kind of been our experience through this. We've learned a lot of, learned a lot of things, some really wonderful things and some not so, some really terrible things actually. In the Clay household, Amy says it's been a long year, a year of learning as well as growth. Shelby is three now and little Sarah just celebrated her first birthday without her daddy. Amy says Shelby still talks about daddy all the time while Sarah really never had the chance to know him. When she talks about our family, I mean it's Mommy, Daddy, Shelby, Sarah. I mean, she, you know, and so we, we look at pictures and we, um, we talk to Daddy and we, you know, um, talk about him and, you know, that kind of thing. Amy says it's those memories of her husband, Jeff, she likes to keep alive. It's difficult, however, to accept what the federal government has decided to make of him. I see so many assumptions made about the kind of person that Jeff must have been that are just appalling and so incredibly incorrect. And I felt like they approach this investigation from, here are two guys who are stupid. And when you look at it like that, well, sure, nothing you could have done could have changed the outcome. If you flip it around, Jeff had a perfect record. And we're not talking about an idiot here. We're talking about somebody who had a perfect flight record, as perfect as any other pilot out there. And you don't want to know how this happened. You don't want to, you don't think this can happen to someone else. Because she says it can and will happen to someone else. 
Amy says she feels it was easier for the NTSB to place blame on what she refers to as the dead guy, as opposed to spending the money to fix the many problems that went into the crash of Flight 5191. I have never said that the crew does not deserve a certain amount of their responsibility. That was Jeff's cockpit, and Jeff would say that exact same thing. But for heaven's sake, do we really want our crews to be operating in a complete absence of information? It, it, it's just it, it's it's just overlooking all of the chances that we have to change something here to fix this. This will happen again. All of those things are still in place. And Amy says they're still in place because you have the federal government investigating itself to fix everything that was involved. Amy feels would cost money, more money, which the government isn't willing to spend. Basically, to me, the only thing that came out of that investigation, 11 months, and I don't even know how many millions of dollars spent, was a deterioration of safety. Because basically what the NTSB did was issue a blank check. They said, here, FAA, here are your towers. You guys do whatever you want. Make decisions about budget ahead of safety. Make decisions that, you know, understaff your tower against your own regs. Understaff it with, and, and bless his heart, understaff it with somebody who has only slept two hours out of the last 24 and is pacing to stay awake. Go ahead and do that. That's not a problem because you guys, you guys don't have any responsibility here. It's not your, that, that's not your job to do anything. Airport, go ahead. Do your construction. Don't provide the information that is needed to be provided. Don't give them a single, don't give them a map that's correct. Don't give them a single one of their notams. Um, don't give them an ounce of information about the airport itself. That's okay because you don't have any responsibility either. I get so tired of seeing the um, clues and cues. They were supposed to have found clues and cues. Do we really want airport navigation to be some sort of puzzle? Doesn't it seem a lot more straightforward and a lot safer to just give them the information that they were supposed to have in the first place? Even through her frustration and anger, Amy says she can't let the past determine her future. She says what she needs now, she's got her children, and the strong support of family and friends. Her gift to Jeff is that he knows she's down here taking good care of things, not only their children, but his name. Whatever mistakes Jeff did or did not make, he's, they're not going to happen again. He's gone. He's never going to be in a cockpit again. Every other thing that went into this, and I mean, we're crazy if we don't think more went into it. Every other thing that went into this is still completely in place to happen again, completely. In the cockpit with Captain Jeff Clay was the first officer, James Polhinky. He was at the controls during the takeoff roll. Sitting in the only part of the plane that did not burn, he survived that crash and may hold the key to exactly what happened that morning. A year since the crash, we've heard little from the sole survivor, but as Jermont Terry tells us, we know it's been a long road to recovery. When flights 5191 crashed, Rescuers were able to pull just one to safety. Crews rushed Pohinky to the emergency room here at UK Hospital. Sure, he was breathing, but his injuries were so severe, doctors were not sure if he would make it or if he would remember anything. Most patients don't have great recollection of the circumstances around their injury when they've had a mild or moderate brain injury. It turns out James Pohinky was not only the sole survivor, but he sat at the controls on August 27, 2006. One month and five days after the August crash, Pohinky finally left the hospital. He underwent dozens of surgeries. He even had a longer road to recovery at Cartney Hill in Lexington. Many people started to wonder what, if anything, Pohinky remembered about the crash. For all, he was in the cockpit. He was there when flight 5191 turned down the wrong runway. Just a little over two months after the crash and a month after Pohinky started his recovery at Cardinal Hill, he was slapped with his first lawsuit. Sure, there were wrongful death suits coming into the courthouse every day, but this was the first naming Pohinky. Family members of the victims and their attorneys started to point blame at the sole survivor and first officer.
Pohinky remained silent. He even quietly boarded the plane, left Lexington in December. Four months after the crash, James Pohinky flew out of the same airport the deadly crash happened and headed back to his home state of Florida. A week later, he released a brief statement speaking for the first time. He said, quote, I left Lexington with mixed feelings to return to Florida to continue my recovery. I'm happy to be back home, but I am at a loss to express my gratitude to the people of Kentucky. He went on to say, not a day goes by that I don't think of the passengers and crew of Flight 5191. My heartfelt sympathy goes out to their loved ones, and they will always be in my thoughts and prayers. Those are the only words we heard from the sole survivor. Not even the NTSB could get a statement from Pohinky while investigating the crash. A crash ultimately ruled as pilot error. One co-pilot we still wait to hear from one year after Flight 5191 went down. 27 News First made a request through a third party to interview the lone survivor, Jim Polhinky. He refused to talk to us. The NTSB also asked to speak with the first officer and were turned down. The NTSB says he's alive today because of the quick response of those first responders. For 49 families, August 27th is a day they'll never forget. On that day, they said goodbye to their loved ones for what was supposed to be a short journey. It turned out to be their final farewell. As Annie Trees tells us, a year later, the healing process continues. The children of Flight 5191 victim Larry Turner courageously got up and spoke at his funeral. That may have been the beginning of their healing process. I think it was. I was able and I was ready, and I'm so thankful that I did, um, just to honor my dad and to show some strength. I really didn't think I'd be able to speak at it, but then I was just thinking back to uh, when my grandfather died and my dad got up and he spoke at his funeral, and then I just really knew that if I didn't get up and speak, I'd regret it for the rest of my life. In the months following the crash, as these impressive young people that Larry and Lois Turner raised so successfully started facing the everyday challenges of life, they were often inspired by memories of their father. I was going through a lot of change. I just graduated from college. Uh, finding a new job, dealing with, um, you know, kind of life as an adult, he faced challenges every day and just remembering um, how he had handled it with grace and humor and gentleness and strength. It was just a huge inspiration to me and I wanted to make him proud. Whenever I encounter various situations, I just think about what dad would have done. As I look back, there are times when I can see great strides of healing that took place. One of which was um, when Clay started working with the Lexington Christian basketball team. I had visited LCA one day just to see some old teachers and, uh, and I saw Coach Houston, the head coach at LCA, and he just approached me and asked me if I'd like to be an assistant and help out with the freshmen and the JV and the big men. Gave me a great outlet to just focus my energies on. And, and within three weeks almost, I, I knew that I was going to get my son back, that he was going to be okay. Lois Turner welcomes any opportunity to talk about her late husband and has continually drawn strength from the support of her community. From the first few hours right after the crash, I made a conscious decision to, to try and be grateful for the 30 years that I had with Larry. And, and that's not to say that I don't think that people who made mistakes shouldn't be held responsible, but um, I, I haven't even been able to summon anger. It's almost a relief that, that we've made it. And, and when I look back at the milestones that we've been through, I'm just, I'm so thankful that we, we have made it with, with God's help and with the help of many friends and family. The family of Pat Smith found solace in continuing his work with Habitat for Humanity. They spent their first Thanksgiving without him by traveling to Mississippi and helping to rebuild the community he had pledged to help and was traveling to on the day of the crash. He would have been there with them on Thanksgiving if Flight 5191 hadn't gone down, so their goal was simple. To complete a project, I mean, it was something he had asked us to do. We hadn't confirmed those plans or done anything by um, the time of the crash. The family hopes a documentary entitled Pat Smith's Habitat Promise will inspire others to try to be the kind of good Samaritan he was. 
I'd love for them to go out and volunteer their time, whether it's with Habitat or another organization, but to realize what a difference one person can make in another person's life. Since losing her husband Michael on that fateful day a year ago, Kathy Ryan hasn't crawled into a shell of grief to hide and heal. My choice has been to be actively involved in what happens. I think that's incredibly important. I feel that's what Michael would want me to do. Um, to honor him and to make sure that his life is valued. The grief process is very much a journey, and still it's almost two steps forward, one step backward. I think we're still on the journey, and, um, and, and we will um, probably continue to heal for the rest of our lives. Certainly one of the saddest stories to emerge from this tragedy was that of John and Scarlett Hooker. The Southern Kentucky couple was married the night before they boarded Flight 5191. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you, Scarlett. Thank you, Scarlett. It was a storybook wedding, 10 groomsmen and 10 bridesmaids. A beautiful beginning to a new life brought to a tragic end just hours later. A year has passed, but the pain still remains for a family. We were so happy for John and for Scarlett for the, the, the accomplishments that they have made up to this point and for the journey that they were getting ready to take as, as a couple and then to wake up the next morning and hear that that journey had, had come to a, a short end. We were, it was just such a change of emotion that it's, it's, it's hard to even describe that it was from the happiest we could ever be for them and to the saddest that we could ever be. The family of John and Scarlett Hooker have established a scholarship fund in the couple's honor. There are also memorials for Hooker at the University of Kentucky and North Laurel High School where he played baseball. Just five days after Flight 5191 crashed, the first lawsuit was filed. Since then, family members for more than 30 victims have filed wrongful death suits against Com Air. Ten of those cases have been settled out of court. The only survivor, First Officer James Polhinky, is also being sued by several of the families. Earlier this month, Comair sued the U.S. government and Bluegrass Airport for a second time. The airline claims the Federal Aviation Administration and the airport should share the blame and the potentially millions of dollars in litigation. Within hours of the crash, attention centered on why Flight 5191 tried to take off from the wrong runway, the much shorter runway that was not lit and used primarily by small private planes. In the months after the tragedy, the pilots were not the only ones being blamed. Fingers also pointed at the lone air traffic controller, the FAA, and the airport. Who or what was to blame for 49 people losing their lives? The wreckage of Flight 5191 littered a field just 1,800 feet from the end of runway 26. The cockpit voice recorder would show the lone air traffic controller instructed the pilots to use runway 22, twice the length of runway 26, twice as wide, and lit up with lights down both sides. As the plane took off the dark runway 26, the first officer remarked, Dad is weird with no lights. Yeah, said the pilot, but it's neither one tried to stop the plane I or question the dark runway again. Good morning. Welcome to the boardroom of the National Transportation Safety Board. Here in Eleven months later, the chairman of the National Report Transportation Safety Board would find that perplexing and troubling. And I scratch my head to understand after the thousands of takeoffs that these men have done over the hours that they have been flying, how they couldn't see the difference at the moment they were beginning as they lined up on the runway. The question of why two experienced pilots who had flown in and out of Bluegrass Airport several times would take off from the wrong runway now, would prove to be difficult to answer. It didn't take long for all of us to realize that no matter how many people we interviewed, how many docu documents we reviewed, no matter how much evidence that we collected, the accident would offer up no easy explanations for us, no simple solutions. There would be no moment where we could point to one thing and say, aha, that is what caused this accident. 31 investigators would spend 13,000 hours examining every facet of the crash, including how little sleep the lone air traffic controller had before his shift, why the pilots were missing notices that updated changes in taxiways and runways because of recent airport construction. The amount of idle chit-chat the pilots had in the cockpit that had nothing to do with flying. 
whether the air traffic controller should have watched Flight 5191 taxi into position and why the pilots missed numerous clues they were in the wrong place. All of this would be studied, no, discussed, no. and debated. This accident has led us into the briar patch of human behavior. One of the first to break the story that pilot Jeff Clay and First Officer Jim Polhinky had tried to take off on runway 26 was CBS correspondent Bob Orr, at the time the network's transportation reporter. I don't think in the end that this is going to have anything to do with that airplane. I think the issues are going to be uh, the crew training, the crew alertness, what were the pilots talking about, what were they doing in the cockpit in the fateful moments before. Both pilots began the morning in the wrong place. They entered the wrong plane and started an auxiliary power unit. In a fateful remark, when told he was on the wrong plane, pilot Clay said, it was going to be one of those days, but oh well, what are you going to do? Both men were experienced pilots. Captain Clay was 35, had 5,300 hours of pilot time, considered fairly experienced, and was described as a by-the-book pilot, but easy to get along with. A first officer who had recently flown with him said his greatest strength was being authoritative, but easy to fly with. Clay had no history of having trouble navigating airports. First Officer Jim Polhinky was 44, with 6,900 hours of pilot time. Those who had recently flown with Polhinky described him as a thorough by-the-book pilot, not hesitant. One captain said Polhinky demonstrated situational awareness and good sterile cockpit discipline. Both men would later be criticized for not paying attention to their surroundings and being distracted by talk not pertaining to flying. There were some things that were, that were done in that cockpit that were that should not have been done, and there were some things that weren't done that should have been done. And the non-pertinent conversation is the one that is the easiest to identify because we've got that evidence right there on our cockpit voice recorder. At its public at meeting all. 11 months after the crash, the NTSB found a contributing factor in the accident was the flight crew's non-pertinent conversations during taxi. They did not maintain what's called a sterile cockpit, meaning once the plane was under its own power, all of their conversations should have been on flying. Federal investigators also said the crew stopped for about 50 seconds at the hold point for a takeoff on runway 26 and should have seen several signs or other markings that would have told them they were in the wrong place. The NTSB concluded the probable cause of this accident was the flight crew member's failure to use available cues and aids to identify the airplane's location on the airport surface during taxi and their failure to cross-check and verify that the plane was on the correct runway before takeoff. The NTSB also said contributing to the accident was the fact the FAA did not require the pilots to get clearance from the air traffic controller to cross a runway. Their heads, heads just weren't in the game here, but I think the issue is what enabled them to make this mistake. One of the questions early on focused on the lone air traffic controller. Flight 5191 was the third plane Christopher Dameron handled that morning. He told investigators he didn't notice the pilots had stopped the plane short of the wrong runway and did not watch them take off. He says he watched Flight 5191 make the turn assumed toward 2-2. He says he turned his back and did some administrative work. He heard a noise and saw fire west of the airport. Dameron, a 17-year controller, told investigators he did not always watch planes finish their taxi and take off. Was his decision to turn around and do paperwork a mistake or poor judgment? It's a question the NTS debated for more than an hour. Either through training or through a lack of oversight, he said it was not his practice to monitor aircraft. That seemed never to be challenged. Nobody raised the issue of, well, maybe you should have. In its final report, the NTSB concluded the controller's paperwork could have waited, that he was likely tired from a lack of sleep, but that they could not be sure how that affected his decision not to watch the plane taxi and take off because it was not a part of his routine. The NTSB also could not be sure that a second air traffic controller would have stopped the crash from happening. Investigators acknowledged the pilots did not have up-to-date information on taxi and runway changes at Bluegrass Airport because of construction, but concluded that was not a factor in the accident. In the end, one central question could not be answered. Why did two experienced pilots with good flying records the morning of August 27, 2006 at Bluegrass Airport lose focus on their jobs?
These are good, decent men that were attempting to do the right thing. I really believe that. But for whatever reason, their, their head wasn't in the game as it had been in the thousands of hours that they had had successfully up to that moment. Joining us now from Washington, D.C., is a member of the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, Debbie Hirschman. Debbie, thank you for spending some time with us. Uh, you sure, were see. on the scene here in Lexington fairly quickly after the crash of Flight 5191. How did that come about that you were the one that came here? Well, the safety board actually has a rotation uh, with different board members being on call. Uh, we take about a week at a time, and it just happened to be the week that I was on call. And I believe you have a, a Kentucky connection with your family? I do. My, ha my husband's family hails from Kentucky, from Lexington, in fact. And uh, um, there are many things about Kentucky that I love, but uh, um, having friends and relatives in the local area certainly um, made it a little bit more difficult to come to the, uh, to the accident scene. Um, so it, it was uh, a tragedy that was a little bit closer to home. Sure. You talked at length uh, during the meeting in July in Washington about the compassion that this community showed you and the other investigators. Could you tell us a little bit about how you felt uh, that went? I think Lexington uh, is a very special community, not just because I have family that's there, but uh, because of the way that they responded to this accident. Um, the NTSB, it's our job to investigate accidents. Um, this was not something that Lexington was prepared for, but when it happened, um, we saw some real grace uh, in the community from everywhere from the, the elected leaders, the leadership of the state and the community, as well as um, the re first responders. Uh, everyone just handled themselves extremely well. Um, cooperation was the golden thread that ran through this accident investigation. Um, we had excellent support, excellent cooperation, and everyone just did their job with such dignity and professionalism. We couldn't have asked for a better team to respond. And then when it came to the community, um, there were just people who would stop us on the, on the road, um, uh, in, the, in restaurants, um, people who were working in, in different places where we went who um, told us we, they appreciated what we were doing. And, um, uh, and that meant a lot to our team. Um, the compassion that the uh, community showed the victims' uh, families, um, just by lining the streets um, and just quiet, um, support for the family members as they rode to uh, visit the accident scene it was incredibly touching. Um, the family members themselves, um, briefing them, they asked excellent questions. They were so um, they were so kind, um, and uh, we don't always see that at accident scenes. There's a lot of grief and a lot of anger, but uh, the family members in Lexington, I think, displayed compassion towards one another and were incredibly um, dignified throughout the whole investigation. They were carrying an enormous weight of something that um, never should have happened, but, um, but they handled themselves um, with just such grace. I, I can't tell you um, how touched our entire team was by our experience in Lexington. It was very unique. Since the crash, the FAA has required airports to add or enhance signs and markings to help pilots navigate the taxiways and runways. Bluegrass Airport sent us these pictures to show changes they've made since the crash. The new hold short markings for runways 22 and 26 are now painted in red and white on the taxiway. A new runway 22 direction sign is painted in yellow and black with an arrow pointing toward the runway. And Bluegrass Airport has added a guidance sign for runway 22. An airport spokeswoman says markings like these have only been used at larger airports, but Bluegrass Airport is going, she says, above and beyond what is required for airports its size. Just moments after Flight 5191 crashed, emergency crews sprung into action. They came from all corners of the city and beyond to lend a hand. For the three first responders credited with saving the only survivor of this crash, nothing could prepare them for what they were about to find. Renee Charles sat down with two of the three men to talk about the event that changed their lives forever. Many people call them heroes. 
So the we're all police officers and we're all here. We all have a job to do just like you do and stuff. And it's just, we were fortunate or unfortunate, depending on how you look at it, that we were able to be the first ones on the scene. James Pete Maupin and John Sully worked for the Bluegrass Airport Police Department. Brian Jarrett for the Lexington Police Department. They were three of the first responders on the scene that day. Jared and Sully say it was such an eerie feeling because neither knew anyone else was on the scene yet. When I saw John, it was it was a uh, uh, overwhelming feeling that you know there's somebody else out here with me. There's somebody that's going to walk through this with me. In the dispatch tapes, you can hear the devastation and the chaos in everyone's voice. These men are credited with pulling the only survivor of the crash to safety. It was their quick thinking and actions that saved First Officer James Polhinky from the burning, twisted wreckage. I mean, I just, I just remember we had to get him out of there. I remember some of the motions of doing it, um, but basically it was just me and Jerry talking to each other. And we actually stayed pretty calm, I think, for the most part. And uh, just knew we had to get him out of there. I didn't feel any emotion at that time because just looking at him, you know, he's, he's very sick. He was hurt pretty bad. And you knew it was right on the line of going one way or the other. And being able to get in there with John and try to work a miracle, it, it was exciting. And I don't, <clears throat> I don't remember feeling that way during any of this until I finally got to UK's emergency room. Right when I got to that emergency room, I had a chance to sit down and <laughs> look back over the last, you know, 30 minutes of my life, and that's when it really hit me hard. As we all know, memories sometimes fade over time, but in this case, it's a scene that a year later still haunts them and is just as vivid in their minds as it was that August morning. A lot of, a lot of fire, the smoke, it was hard to see. The visibility was extremely low. Approaching the, approaching the actual wreck itself was just to see a lot of um, some of the things that I saw and the other guy saw, it just, it, 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 there's no words to describe it. Sally says it's difficult to think about, and it probably always will be. It's like a little piece in our brain that'll never go away in my mind. I mean, there's a lot of times where we're not thinking about it, you know, we're working, taking different calls or with the family, but something will trigger it. and. I know, I'm sure the same with the chair. I can play it back step by step. As police officers, they train for all types of situations, but nothing could prepare them for this. No, no. I wasn't prepared. I mean, in somewhat, I have a fire experience background. Um, so I, that's kind of level I was at, because that's all I was seeing was fire. Um, but it, it didn't really prepare me, because I didn't know what to do. I mean, I knew what to do as far as try to find a victim, try to, you know, save lives, but the whole shebang, I mean, looking at a big picture and trying to dice it all apart to know at every step what to do, no, I mean, I was clueless. There was an amazing range of emotions that day for these two, but when it was all over, the only emotion left was exhaustion. When, when we were done with that, like, I remember I went home at noon and I went right into my house and I took all my clothes off. Yeah. Because the jet fuel, my uniforms kind of singed, took all my stuff off, and um, I went and sat in my shower for like an hour. I remember it was solid black. Since that day, their lives have all changed. Through all of it, I, I met my wife, and, uh, you know, I guess a year later, we're married and uh, looking forward to a baby boy here in December, so. After the crash, I want to kind of get away, so. I talked to the sheriff, Kevin Corman, down in Jessamine County, which I tried to work before. And uh, he had some good changes once he won the election. And I decided to jump on board with him and go back home where I'm from and uh, help him out. Uh, I've got engaged. I'm due to be married October. But there is one thing that they say will always stay the same. This tragedy has bonded these men together for life. It's such, you know, a traumatic event. and. It affected all of our lives so much that the bond is that we shared that experience together and 
you know, and it's grown from that. We weren't allowed to talk to James Pete Maupin, who is still with the airport police department, but Jared and Sally tell us he's doing well. Pete's the best friend of ours. I can say that 100% sitting here. And, um, you know, we each have our good months and bad months. It's gone from days to weeks to months now. And um, Pete's, Pete's a strong person, and Pete's, uh, he's held us up a couple times. Something Maupin said a few months ago when the three received the Top Cops Award still rings true today. Uh, it's still not over yet for us. Uh, so we uh, solicit your prayers. Uh, your continued support uh, because there's still a lot of tough days still to come. At a private reception following this afternoon's memorial service, victims' family members presented commemorative coins to nearly 100 first responders, each one engraved with the words with gratitude. One of those first responders was no stranger to death, but he had never encountered anything like this. Gary Ginn has been the Fayette County coroner for several years, but all of his experience could not prepare him for what he was about to see. Our Bill Bryant recently sat down with Ginn, who a year later is still troubled by that fateful Sunday morning. Mr. Ginn, thank you very much for being here. What are your thoughts as you remember back to that morning of the crash? I understand you were already awake that morning. I was awake. Um, my wife and I helped out with our uh, worship service at church. And um, I was at the point of getting dressed. And rather than putting on a suit to go to church, I put on khakis and some work boots and was headed out to Bluegrass Airport. When you got there, when did you know and how did you know that this was something large scale and terrible? Well, the aircraft itself was very large, um, and there was still a lot of steam, uh, a lot of smells, jet fuel, a lot of uh, burning from the rubber and, and foam rubber from the seats and things. The, um, of course, the airport had, uh, the firemen had placed the foam on the, on the aircraft, and a lot of that was still there. Um, it was real difficult to see the individuals in the aircraft when I first got there. And you had to actually stand there for a couple of minutes and focus in on just one area of the aircraft. And when you did that, it was very evident that there was a large number of people that were in the aircraft. And, and at that point, I knew that it was going to be a large scale. Did you have hope of more survivors on the plane at that moment? At that point, I did not because um, the, air, the airport fire department uh, was on scene. Uh, there was some a few police on scene at that time, and um, we did have hope for um, uh, the co-pilot, uh, Pohinki, um, and really that was the only hope that we had there. Many tasks involved in this, none of them easy, certainly from removing the bodies, identifying the bodies, investigating the crash. But when you had to notify those families, that had to be very tough. What, uh, what were you, uh, how did you do that? Well, um, I feel it is an obligation to the community uh, to provide information to the news. Um, obviously, I knew that there was a lot of people that had already been notified about the crash. Um, we like to notify families in person. Uh, I knew that that was pretty much impossible. Um, I did try to, to attend every news briefing uh, that I was asked to attend. That's pretty much how I notified the families that they had lost their loved ones, by, was by the news, uh, which was difficult because we don't usually do that. But um, rather than give them hope, which um, I didn't think was good um, because the hope wasn't there, uh, then I made the decision to go ahead and, and tell the public by the news that, um, that there were no survivors other than Mr. Or the co-pilot uh, Pohinki. Mr. Ginn, is it hard to put all of this out of your mind to this day a year later? I work with it every day. Very tough, huh? still tough. For nearly everyone involved, a year later, the day is still, as you can see, they're fresh in their minds. Just after the crash, a banner was placed in a parking lot at the airport to remember the victims. 
Family, friends, and even strangers stopped by for days to leave messages, flowers, and other mementos. The banner was there for nearly a month before being moved inside to the Aviation Museum at Bluegrass Airport. It's still there today, open for the public to see and read the comments left for the victims. The banner was one of the first memorials for the victims, but certainly not the last. Shortly after the crash, city and state leaders put together a commission to decide on a permanent memorial. Made up of community leaders, the group has already met, but is taking its time, considering several different options. And while we wait for a decision, many other tributes have already been dedicated to crash victims. There is a sandcastle for a man who devoted his life to building homes for people in need. At UK, a tribute in right field to a former wildcat who loved the game. Scholarships are named for two men who loved higher education and made it priority to teach others. A bench at a youth baseball field, a simple reminder of a father who loved watching his son play baseball, and a park where dogs and their owners can play together, an honor for a woman who cared deeply for man's best friend. They are all simple personal tributes to people taken too soon. For just this handful, there are countless others, each special and a way to keep someone's memory alive. My main thing with the anniversary and everything is I don't want anybody to forget them. Marion Queen knows that firsthand. She lost her father and stepmother, Les and Kay Morris, in the calm air crash. That scares me that, you know, as years go by, they'll forget them. And that's the reason behind a Flight 5191 Memorial Commission. Jerry Vandermeer is co-chair. No one has any perceived, preconceived notion of what it should be. We're really going to let that kind of perk to the top, to what the family's desires are. At its first meeting last month, the commission came under fire when some family members were afraid they wouldn't have a say in what the memorial would be. At that first meeting, the commission took ideas and suggestions from the victims' families, including plans to delay future meetings until after the first anniversary. We do want to give enough time to, to have the right information and do have the right memorial that is a tribute to, to the victims who, who lost their lives. The commission doesn't have a location or even a definite time frame of when something might be selected. The one thing for certain, there are a number of possibilities. Uh, in doing some of our research, uh, we have found uh, things from memorial gardens to prayer gardens to uh, a different uh, 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 memorial with names on them. Another person working with the commission, Sherry Weisenflew with Hospice of the Bluegrass. She has counseled a number of the victims' family members and knows firsthand how important it is to the families that a permanent memorial be put in place. I know that there have been some ideas of, you know, that it doesn't have to be uh, like a monument, something that's, that's there. Whatever decision is made, she knows it will be a meaningful one and that the people of Lexington will come forward like they did in those days following that terrible accident. This is a community that cares. It's a community that wants to remember. Uh, and we want to continue this uh, into the future, and that's why we're talking about having something that's more long-lasting. And as for something that is more permanent, the Flight 5191 Memorial Commission is also looking at how other cities have handled tragedies of this magnitude. Well, for many people, August 27, 2006 will be remembered as the day 49 people lost their lives, and the grieving began and continues to this day. Nearly everyone in central Kentucky had some connection to either a victim or family member who lost someone in the crash a year ago. In the next few months, our community will move forward with plans for that permanent memorial. Until then, we leave you tonight with a look back at today's memorial service and the faces of Flight 5191. stormy seas I am strong when I am on your shoulders you raise me up to more than I can be
strong when I am on your shoulder. You raise me up to more than I can be. Yeah.